If each little kid could have fresh milk each day If each one who worked had enough time to play If each homeless soul had a good place to stay It could be a wonderful world mm -hmm. It could be a wonderful world If we could consider each other A neighbor, a friend, or a brother It could be a wonderful, wonderful world It could be a wonderful world mm -hmm. It could be a wonderful world I have an unabiding faith in our city. Immediately after the, George Floyd was, was killed by our police officers, I called for charges and, and we terminated the, the officers that were involved. Um, when you know, 1,500, 2,000 people came to my home demanding uh, that I abolish the police, uh, I said no. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I'm Kate Knuth. I am a mom. I'm a climate strategist and scholar. I'm a small business owner. I'm a three-term state legislator and I'm running for mayor of Minneapolis. And I think we need a new mayor of Minneapolis. In, in my family, a good life was defined by living, being of, and in service of our community. So when I talk about that value of community, the way it shows up for me, it's kind of, I actually didn't plan on being a politician for most of my life. I spent my early days, well, up through my 20s, probably um, planning to be a research scientist. I wanted to be an entomologist. I really love insects. And as I got to study more and understand the world, I, I became increasingly concerned about how environmental change was impacting nature, and then even more concerned about how it impacts people. And that's really what I built my career on. It Actually, just 14 months after Hurricane Katrina hit, I was elected to the state legislature. Um, I served uh, six years there. I was, we did a lot of great climate work then. I, um, I was known as a climate champion in the legislature. I built a leadership program at the University of Minnesota um, for grad students. I helped, uh, I was the first chief resilience officer for the city of Minneapolis. Um, when I did a PhD, I, 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 I got it by asking the question of how we drive the significant transformational, structural, systemic change needed to really take on these big challenges like we have, like poverty, like public safety, like racial injustice, like climate justice. Um, and so I really feel like I've built my career moving in and through and with large publicly accountable institutions, our government, our public university, to make them work well for what we need to do now. And so all people can thrive. And in Minneapolis, we're at a really potentially transformative moment. I think we can feel it um, in the unsteadiness, in the conflict, in the fear of, of our systems not doing what we think we, what, what we think they're designed for, they're doing what they're designed for, but doing what we want them to do. Um, and we're hungry for leadership that will help us move through this time to get to a better Minneapolis that works for everyone, black, brown, indigenous, young, old, um, regardless of race, ability, zip code. Um, and I've been frustrated by the mayor's leadership uh, over several years, but particularly in this moment. A few things. I have no idea what a chief resilience officer does. Yeah. <laughs> I know that we have one. And that it's, you know, I remember when, when it first happened, but I always kind of thought, what in the world is, is this some kind of new agey uh, nonsense? Yeah, it's interesting because we got this grant so, in Minneapolis so, to so do it. So tell us a little Paul bit did. about what. Yeah, what, so, what so the it? idea is basically in um, an increasingly globalized, interconnected society with climate change ramping up the way we see it happening, you know, in, in the state, but even more so across the world, there's just more risk and vulnerability in our society. And so 
having someone whose job it is to think about the whole system of the city um, in relationship with the community, the potential threats that affect our community in both short term, like hard hitting threat, like right now pandemic. <laughs> um, I mean, it, it feels very long term, but it's it's shorter term than say decaying infrastructure over decades. Um, and then these longer, slower moving things, actually like climate um, impacts with increased water over time. Phil Sturm, uh, would you like to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about, about your campaign? Uh, uh, so I'm Phil Sturm, I jumped in for the mayor's race. Um, basic information, I'm 40 years old. I live in Winona neighborhood. Um, been living in Minneapolis for about 18 years now. Uh, I've been working in manufacturing and operations for about 10 years. I've, my history in the city is I've lived in like near North neighborhoods, Whittier neighborhoods, uh, Standish, Lindale, and Winona over the years. Um, so I've kind of lived sort of in the central core area. Um, I sort of progressed through life from, well, I'll start at 2003. I, I was in the Marine Corps and I got out, came, to, came back home to Minneapolis um, spent some time readjusting to civilian life after my deployments. Um, my housing experience, I've lived anywhere from illegal basement apartments to renting apartments, duplexes, and then buying a home in South Minneapolis in Winona neighborhood. Um, community experience, I've recently uh, served on the 9-11 MPD group. Uh, researching alternative responses for police calls to divert police, uh, to divert calls away from the police. Um, the, out the outcome of that group was to start a couple pilot programs for, you know, mental health response, embedding mental health professionals in 911 to send more appropriate resources. Uh, 2018, I volunteered shortly with the Hennepin County Sheriff's Department as a special deputy, wanting to learn more about public safety, um, to see it from the inside, learn their, how they do things, their processes, procedures, their training, to try and get like a ground, ground experience. Um, I've generally been somewhat politically active. I've volunteered for Raymond Dean's campaign. Um, way back in the day, I was a veteran for Cary after coming back home. Uh, I was SD 62 DFL district co-chair for a short period of time. And that's sort of the gamut of my resume, if you want to call it that. Um, I'm running because I didn't see anybody from a working class background. So my name is Sheila Najad. I grew up in Fargo, well, was born in Fargo, grew up in Woodbury and have been in Minneapolis for the last 12 years, resident of the central neighborhood now. And I'm running for mayor because I believe that we can create a better Minneapolis by putting the people at the center of government. After the murder of George Floyd, it was clear that our city's leadership was not prepared to meet the me needs of the moment. And I've spent years fighting campaigns for a deep and authentic policy change at City Hall uh, from the, the community level as an organizer. I'm an organizer. I am a 10 year veteran of the restaurant industry. I'm a renter, a queer woman, and a daughter of an immigrant. And I'm so excited to run this year because as we know, 2021, is a whole new political landscape. And I see a lot of beautiful possibilities for creativity and change. And I see my campaign as a call to action, as a grassroots movement for the people of Minneapolis to work towards transformative change, accountability, and creative sustainability for a peaceful future for everyone, for an equitable future for everyone, not just a select few.
So sustainability, we often think about in terms of, of climate change, and that's certainly part of it. But I think sustainability of government solutions is also something we need to think about. And one example maybe is like, so we've seen kind of band-aid approaches to public safety or attempted solutions for public safety, like paying for a lot of helicopters to go around and catch people stealing cars, right? That's, that's not creative sustainability. Creative sustainability, I think, would be finding out, okay, why are people stealing cars? What, what do they need to not do that? And how can we develop programs to make sure that long-term, and, and my hypothesis is, right, it has to do with a lack of access to good jobs, a lack of access to youth programming, and a general lack of, of feeling like you have strong relationships in the community. Um, and so- uh, And we've seen a significant attrition in our department this year, as we know, uh, normally on an annual basis, we see somewhere between 40 and 45 officers leave uh, for either resignation or retirement. Uh, and this year, uh, needless to say, that number has far exceeded that and it has hamstrung our chief in many different respects. Now, let's be clear though, our uh, commitment to public safety is not exclusively focused on police. Far from it. Uh, we have laid the groundwork in our city we have invested in a number of initiatives uh, of safety beyond policing, ranging from our group violence intervention program to our next step hospital-based intervention. From our Minneapolis violence interrupters uh, to mental health co-responders. And speaking of the mental health co-responder program, which we are in the process of, of bringing citywide, uh, if we're looking to enhance that program even further and have certain calls be diverted from the 911 dispatch so that they can get a response from, from an individual that is not an officer, we agree on that too. Uh, um, but if, if the goal is simply to dramatically reduce the number of police officers that we have in our department and hamstring our chief, no, I cannot sign on to that. This notion that in order to have a more comprehensive public safety strategy, you need to do with one critical element, which is police, is wrong. Um, it is wrong. We all signed on to a year-long community engagement process where we would listen to people, whether they were for getting rid of the police department entirely or therefore adding to it dramatically. We promised that we would listen. That process is getting underway right now, and I don't think it's fair to go through a whole process of fake engagement where we've already presupposed the outcome. Why are we gonna pay for an analysis that we're ultimately not gonna listen to? Why are we waiting for data that we're not gonna use? Let's use the data, let's listen to the experts, let's do right by our community, and make sure that we know what we're talking about before we set long-term staffing levels well into the future. So we also, I think, should be giving great credence to our chief, who over, you know, has over 30 years of experience in this police department, has made steadfast commitments to procedural justice and culture shift within our police department. Those efforts are underway right now. He's telling us what we need. He's telling us and providing the resources that he will need uh, to ultimately get this job done of ensuring community safety, public safety for everyone in our community. We don't need to agree with him 100% of the time, but we should listen. We need to dream about a better future, but we cannot sleepwalk on the public safety of our residents and our businesses. Whether you live in Linden Hills, Jordan neighborhood, Bancroft, Standish, Seward, um, crime is occurring. The shootings, the carjackings, the assaults, the robberies. You know, that's been 10 months since George Floyd was murdered and our city went through a really painful, the painful experience of, of witnessing him being killed and then the civil unrest. And we're really, people are aching for leadership that is willing to step forward with courage in strong relationship to be clear in purpose and values and open to many voices and solutions. 
Um, and that's the kind of leadership I bring. First and foremost, the salient issue is public safety. After everything that's been going on, we're not seeing much of a change in policing. Um, they can talk, we talk about new initiatives, we talk about different training, procedural justice, empathy, you know, giving cops a script to use to de-escalate. But the reality on the ground is it's not changing. You know, I mean, you can you can train people to act one way in the training room, but when you get out to the street, you know, the FTOs, the training officers obviously tell them something different and they're just there escalating and controlling with violence. And it just seems like every chance they get, they take a shot on people. It's just very unprofessional. So it's a grand philosophical question. How do you stop crime from happening? Which uh, you can't. Um, so like my- So well, the police don't stop crime from happening. They react to crime happening, but the crime okay. is happening because of secular economic uh, cycles and so more police doesn't make less crime. I don't think there's ever been any, all the criminology studies have been showing that there's no correlation between police staffing and crime. It's, it's over-determined by other factors, in my opinion. I don't, crime rates aren't really affected by patrol staffing, whether or not you have 50 on patrol or 35 on patrol or 80 on patrol. We went through huge upheavals in our society with the riots George Floyd, COVID, economic dislocation. These are the things that are driving the crime. It's, I don't think it's the police staffing that's doing it. It's people aren't in school, everything's shut down. So it's just, we're in a huge time of upheaval and dislocation. And that's, and that's what you're gonna see as a natural result of that. Like the equilibrium of the city was disrupted. And one of the points I like to make is 500, committed police officers are better than 1,000 uncommitted, uncaring police officers. So we should, you know, we don't need a minimum number requirement. A lot of blame gets put on the union, but that's kind of a political dodge sometimes. A lot of politicians just aren't willing to take on the police department. It's kind of a scary enemy to make. They can come the, they can come at you pretty heavy and they are, they're very good at smearing people if you go after them. But but I would like to say that it's kind of, it's a falsehood that the police just need good faith politician partners to enact reform because the police profession, they know what they need to do. They've always known they could, they could have reformed themselves on their own last year, five or 10 years ago. They could do it tomorrow. They know, I mean, other departments have done it. And part of that problem is there is no, since there is no national police standards authority like other professions have, you know, like doctors, lawyers, engineers. There is a lack of a professionalization in the system, which leads to these precinct level cultures of violence and racism. And it, so it comes down to local municipalities trying to create cultures in their police departments, but there is no national backup. So it's mayors going up against police unions, city councils going up against police chiefs. The politics is kept at the local level. So it's a lot harder to push change without any professional backup. So reducing the violence would be like demilitarizing the police culture um, and revamping the indoctrination process instead of teaching the police that they are there to kick ass and take names, they're there to like keep the peace and serve the community. And they need to think more strategically about how their actions are impacting the greater overall, you know, temperature of the community, whether they're making things better or worse, or they're just trying to get arrests in. Uh, the incentives on the discipline side are to just stonewall drag it out so if we could take that discipline side and sort of bracket it out from direct police administrative control because if it takes two weeks to write somebody up because they very obviously struck somebody who's handcuffed and it was very obviously 
force in excess of what was necessary to effect the arrest. You know, it kind of ties in also to, they told that now we have a, now the police have a duty to report when they see wrongdoing. And then we just had these couple incidents this past week where people were using excessive force. Nobody reported it. So, I mean, we can, we can change the policy on the edges. We can add little things here that everybody knows they're going to ignore, but it sounds good to say, hey, we changed the policy. Now, if the police see something wrong, they have to say something. Well, that was always true. <laughs> they always had to say something. They just never did it. Yeah, part of the discipline problem is it takes two years to write people up, <clears throat> and then the supervisors don't even know people are being written up. And so, if you know, write-ups need to be done in two or three weeks. Part of my approach is to really attack the militarization culture, which drives the violence and drives the racism in the system. It's just overly, overly macho, overly military. You know, they're police, they're not warriors. Um, so just sort of systematically dismantling the culture from the from the point they come into the academy and then all the way through as they're trying to get promoted. I think that we need to fun fully fund safety in Minneapolis. And to talk about that, we need to broaden the conversation from police to safety. And for the Safety Charter Coalition, so I am a member of the Vote Yes Coalition. I've been in it since the very beginning. I was actually one of the people who did all the research and drafted the language for the proposed amendment. So I've learned the deep- And this is which of the two? This is the um, community petition. Okay. Yep. So what it does is strikes the police department as a required charter department and replaces it with a department of public safety that uses a public health approach to safety which includes hiring more mental health professionals, hiring more social workers who can help with wraparound services. And the amendment also includes law enforcement as uh, an optional tool among many of creating safety in the city. So would there be- Acting, going rogue this summer, perpetrating widespread violence against protesters, press, myself as a medic, um, I was shot by the Minneapolis police with a crowd control um, weapon. And that was all while I was under the direct control of the mayor. And so I think that the problem is not about the, the let me rephrase. I think that the solution is in this new approach to public safety that takes a public health approach which means we're gonna focus a lot more on violence prevention, a lot more on saying, okay, crime and harm, the majority of crime that happens is not because of um, random violence or individual moral failures, it's because people don't have what they need to survive. So if we're taking a public health approach to addressing violence, that means that we are getting in ahead of things before harm happens, that we're investing in things like better sex ed and relationships, um, education on healthy relationships. That's how we prevent domestic violence, right? Cops showing up on the scene doesn't prevent domestic violence, right? In many cases, it makes it worse. So this new department would allow us the flexibility in terms of both structure and in budget, right? Because right now, we're like locked into a bad contract where we have to fund the police at the tune of 35% of our general fund. And so this new department allows us the flexibility. And I think that putting it under the control of the council um, allows more accountability and accessibility to the people. And what the next step will be to ensure that, yes, we actually get things done is going to be crafting the, the policies and ordinances that govern the structure and operations of this department. And community has to be involved in that process as well. Uh, I, I got to watch, signing. I was, I, yeah, I, uh, the Paris Climate Accord in 2015, I was 
very lucky to get to witness it signed in person. I was a non an NGO observer, a non-governmental organization observer, and there's literally a few names drawn out of a hat, and I got I was one yeah, of the names that cool. got drawn. It was a highlight of of my life for sure. Um, yeah. The frustrating things is we have this international agreement and the United States could take such leadership. I think with President Biden, we are making that turn, but the for, the timing of it in terms of just the, the pace and scale we need to reduce emissions to avoid the worst impacts. The Trump years were really important years. Um, yeah, so, but then again, a lot of cities and states yeah, a lot of cities and states have stepped up, um, but even they're increasingly stepping up. This is actually another reason I'm running for mayor. Um, I think the city of Minneapolis has done a lot of good work. I think the city absolutely has a role in um, improving the lives of our immigrant communities and working class communities. And it's a big question, right? And I think it runs across all the work of all city departments, but we can start in looking at the places where we have the highest disparities. So housing, I think, is a huge place to start. Who has access to good, safe housing? And our city can improve um, quality of life for all folks by increasing uh, tenant protection. So I'm a lifelong renter. I've had to move one time I moved three times in one year because of either bad landlords or skyrocketing rents um, that I could no longer afford. So I'm really excited about um, the idea of having uh, increased protection for tenants and, and the city can also have a role in, in educating landlords of what they are actually supposed to be doing and what they can't do. and. I think one area that we need to expand to yesterday was transgender day of visibility and the city has the opportunity to do trainings with landlords on um, anti-discrimination trainings when it comes to to trans folks in the community trans tenants and the city also has these really great folks um, tenant navigators and so a lot of um, council aides or just general folks in the city can call these tenant navigators if they're having trouble with a landlord or don't understand their rights. And unfortunately, our current mayor um, cut funding for that in the last year, despite the community turning out and wanting more funding for that. And Part of a priority for me, especially early on, um, should I have the honor of being mayor, it, one of the priorities is making sure we have really strong leadership in the city. Um, and what I mean by that is part one of the jobs of mayor is, or one of the powers of the job of mayor in Minneapolis is to um, hire department heads. And I think we need to be really clear about what kind of leadership, what kind of people we have in these different departments, the tone they will set with their staff, the relationships they will have with community. And it's been actually one of my frustrations with the current mayor, his, his seem of la lack of interest, I guess I would say maybe, um, in the hiring of department heads. Um, the city attorney, I think, is the one where there's been a hiring process. Otherwise, it's been holdovers or bringing people up from assistant or deputy. How leadership and power works in our time, which is more distributed, which is more idea and narrative driven, which is more relationship driven, and less embodied in positions of power or in formal formal leadership positions. Those things still matter, especially as you said, from a convening role, which this, the mayor's position really holds a lot of power in that. And this is the way I like to approach my leadership um, is, is bringing people together around a shared sense of purpose and values and what we can build and do together. I think I wanna highlight that your government cares about you. That, it, I mean, I almost tear up a little bit because I feel like we've been through just the past year and the, I, when a person of the state literally kills someone in our community, which has happened with George Floyd um, and way too many times before that and since, um, that's like a fundamental break of trust with your government caring about you. Um, and then there's also, I think, We've been through such trauma with 
the pandemic with four years of a president who said, who was intense, totally on dividing us. Um, this is not in my like preparation talking points, but it's something I have felt so deeply um, when, uh, when President Biden was elected and his choice to have a memorial ser service for pandemic victims the night before his inauguration. Um, I, I mean, I pretty much wept because I had been so hungry for a public leader saying, and not just saying, showing, this is hard. People have suffered, people are suffering and I'm here and we're here and we're gonna keep working at it. Um, and we're not necessarily gonna be perfect instantly. We're not gonna have all the right answers ourselves. We're gonna need you to come along, but we're gonna get through it. But there's something fundamental about basic competence in government as important for the quality of our lives. And I think the vaccine rollout is a very specific example of that at the federal government. Um, I think response to uh, crisis, uh, particularly in the, the summer is an example. Like people experienced our, our public systems failing in real and significant ways and scary ways. Um, and so I think, I, I think, and I, I'm betting on that people are just also very interested in having our government just function well to, to deliver the basic services that make our lives work and that keep our city running. You know, in a one in a million shot, I get anywhere near the office, the chief would probably have more of a problem putting up with my style because I would probably be stepping on his toes more and getting more and interfering in the daily operations of the police to drive that accountability from the top down. So the, the question would be more finding a chief that would put up with that. I think an interesting thing that's going on in the city right now is we, everybody says we have a housing crisis. Everybody says there's an affordability crisis. And then this Upper Harbor Terminal project comes in and like the standard is to sell it off to the developers, create a mixed use development market rate with a carve out for affordable housing and concert hall or whatever. But it seems that if we really do have this problem and if we really are committed to addressing it, that's 48 acres or whatever it is where you can create a cooperative housing development like Co-op, I don't know if you know of Co-op City in New York City, this gigantic cooperative housing development that they built in like the 70s, I think. That was a, it's a pretty successful story of affordable housing. And that's sort of my vision is we talk about gentrification, we talk about people being displaced. Um, and then we're like, well, we'll carve out some new development. So every, every apartment building has to have affordable based on AMI or whatever, but we have space in the town. We just need the political desire and the vision to sort of push through a new vision on housing. Yeah, um, I definitely think that we should, what I call normalize relations with unhoused neighbors, because the reality is, you know, they are residents of the city. They are a constituency of the city and they're not being treated like that. You know, they're just being treated as a problem. And you know, there's people talk about crime and drugs, but there's more people doing drugs in apartments and houses than there's people doing drugs in encampments or whatever. And it's just the fact that it's a tent. It creates this psychological feeling that it's inherently different or inherently more dangerous when it really isn't, I don't, in my opinion. Well, that's a good segue then to talking about the state of the city, the economics of the city, the all level of unemployment, poverty, homelessness, hunger. Uh, so do you, some people say that those are all at, at crisis proportions and that the city has a responsibility to, you know, try to mitigate those problems. Others say, no, that's the state's problem, the county's problem, the, the federal government does food stamps, you know, and, uh, you know, that the city's job is, you know, Keep, keep the streets safe and keep them plowed and pick up the garbage. You know, it's, they're not a social service provider. Uh, so where do you come on that? And, and do you think it's a crisis and do you think the city has a role in, in addressing it? Well, well, obviously the city does more than just basic services. You know, there's a public housing authority and there's all these sort of infrastructure we already have in place to deal with, the economic issues. Um, 
yes, with gentrification and housing and economic upheaval, there's a crisis in a coming crisis as well with renters and evictions and people getting back to work. And there is some federal help coming with the COVID rescue bill, um, you know, putting money in on the rental assistance side, housing assistance side, or helping business, small businesses stay afloat. What do you think of the uh, 2040 plan, the city planning document that was passed? Are you familiar with it? Yeah, I'm basically familiar with it. I, uh, I would have liked to have seen the quadplex, the fourplexes stay in the plan. Yeah, I think it would have helped the economics of it more. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm not clear on, will duplexes and triplexes be economic, as economically viable to make? As, so you agree with the increased density argument? You just didn't think they went far enough? Right. So it was a compromise that had to be made, but will that compromise... You know, will it affect a lot of change? I'm not sure yet. Who is my idea for that is to make for small businesses, immigrant, first generation businesses, stuff like that. I would like to create zones in those areas impacted by the destruction to basically make it free to do business in the city in those areas. Um, the city can not, you know, either refund business license charges, you know all those associated fees that go with running businesses. I don't really want to vote for any of the ones changing the charter. I'm not for the strong mayor amendment. I'm not for the charter commission doing its thing. It's kind of working in the background against people. And there should be a way to bring that into more democratic control, in my opinion. Some, some parts of Lake Street and and Northeast and the North Loop, right, are unrecognizable from what they were five years ago or, or 10 years ago and um, see a lot of, of course. One year ago. Or one year ago. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I think, so I think that the East Phillips urban farm is a perfect example of a community solution to so many of these problems, right? So for folks who are, are watching this and are unfamiliar with the project, it's at the corner of Hiawatha and 28th, there's this building that um, is an unused building owned by the city. And um, the city wants to, has been talking for a long time about turning a water equipment warehouse. And the community has come up with this wonderful plan for an indoor urban farm that would address hunger because it would provide free or low cost food for the community. It would create jobs. It would also be a space where small businesses could come. They said that they are, can fit up to a hundred business stalls in there, which would be incredible, right? Especially for places who lost their businesses um, on Lake Street or, or just looking for, for a smaller, more affordable size. It would be a community center where people can gather and build relationships. It's this fantastic opportunity that would address so many of those issues. And investing in things like that, I think, is, is part of the solution. The same thing with the Upper Harbor Terminal. So right now, the, the city led by Jacob Fry has, is pushing to put a concert venue in there that would benefit the wealthy, right? and the Polats who, who um, are becoming wealthier on top of super wealthy by extracting land and capital um, from the people of Minneapolis. So control one, I feel like is a little bit. I think we need to be operating right now off of an abundance of precaution, period. Uh, that means that you know, right now we've obviously had quite a bit of time to prepare uh, and, you know, I, I think it's traumatizing uh, for communities to experience any form of violence. And we need to make sure that, that, that we've got the right tools in place. And we've been working, uh, you know, since late summer, we've been working with a number of different jurisdictions, our mutual aid partners, the state of Minnesota, to make sure that we have the right plan in place. And that culminated with our request for the National Guard in December. Uh, we'll have up to around 2,000 National Guard members that will and can be on hand as we get closer into jury deliberations and the verdict. One of the 
biggest difficulties that we saw through uh, the events of late May and early June was this abundance of misinformation. And what we want to make sure going forward is that we've got the necessary community outreach in place with trusted partners that allows for two-way communication, both for us to receive very important intelligence, but also for us to provide it. And that means getting the information out to our press corps, and I know that CCO is going to be doing that very important work, and also, also some of our more culturally specific radio stations and, and TV networks to make sure that all communities throughout have that very important information right from the get-go. Uh, you know, communication is an asset, it's a strength, uh, it, it's a tool that we can use, and we want to make sure we're using it as effectively as possible to dispel the information that we know that some of these groups, outside agitators, white supremacists, are going to be using to cause chaos in our city. for the last 40 years in this country we've been operating on the assumption that the police can regulate themselves and this assumption is obviously false now like after 2020 people can't really be making that argument and the current administration is sort of just letting the chief run things quote unquote and you know so it's always refer to the chief or oh, the chief is doing this we're working with the chief and the mayor's kind of taking a hands-off approach Pushback is going to be, you don't know what you're doing, but as a mayor, you need to get in there and start interrupting. Part of the problem is you can have 12 community complaints, you can have reprimands and you still get promoted because they think that's the good cop. They wear the complaints, they wear the discipline as a badge of honor because they're tough cops getting in there, getting dirty, doing what needs to be done. So one thing the mayor can do aside from disciplinary stuff, which they don't seem to care that much about is you just stop, you put a freeze on promotions, you put a freeze on everything you take away. They don't care about being violent because it just means they get promoted to Sergeant. And now if you come in as a mayor and say, this is stopping, we're gonna review every single step, every single promotion from a community perspective and you can do that regardless of the union. You, could, you don't, there's nothing stopping a mayor from doing stuff like that to sort of start putting in controls. As far as increasing housing density, I don't know that they're going to see a huge deluge of people building duplexes and triplexes. I don't, we'll see if it does. I, I'm kind of skeptical if it's gonna make any huge change. So you don't really if think other places, if we're gonna get the kind of density we need for the benefits that are that are being touted is I don't that think, what you're saying yeah i don't think the promises will live up to reality as much yeah i'm just running to like i said i'm running to bring uh you no know, more of a working class perspective to government not just so we're not just voting for lawyers all the time and my plan is i want to hit the ground and bring day one accountability to the police department by disrupting the pipelines that are currently operating, which is rewarding bad behavior, driving away the police that want to do better, and just, and not sort of push, push things off to the future and say, well, we'll build a bureaucracy, well, we'll build a committee, and we'll see what happens in four years type of thing. A challenging incumbent is a, is a thing, um, and that I definitely recognize with that with this campaign. Um, and I, at the same time, think people in this city are, are sensing that the moment we're in is, requires uh, a different kind of leadership, very rooted in purpose and values and community and very open to multiple the, the multiple paths that it will take to deliver on those values and that change and the openness to being in relationship, even and especially when it's uncomfortable. Um, and a recognition of the, the scale of the challenges we, safe and the, we, we face and the potential for really meeting them. And I, I, at the end of the day, I hope people see me, if, if it, well, someone asked me recently, what, if, if you're elected and you look back in four years, um, what would you hope to accomplish? I, I want 
my mayoral term to help people in Minneapolis dream about and then begin to build a city that really works for each of us. Um, and that truly builds this beautiful multiracial democracy that I think that's promised in our country. And I think we have the potential to build in Minneapolis. This unsteady moment, this conflict, like that's part of it. And I think we can move through it in a way that we're all proud of when we look back at this moment. Um, and so really at the end of the day, I'm running for my daughter's future. Like any parent, I think what you do is based partially on your own kids, but even more, I'm running so every parent in this city can feel like when they send their kid out the door to school, their kid is safe from gun violence. Their kid is going to get um, an opportunity to, to build a life and thrive. The kid is going to be safe from our public safety and police system. Um, Appreciate everybody's input, whether that's, you know, saying nice things or it's, it's going after me a little bit. That, that's the very nature of, of being a mayor is you're bound to get attacked from all different sides. Our city does not quit and neither do I. The way that Reclaim the Block came about was out of a protest in the mayor's office. We were protesting police violence and we went to the mayor's office and we occupied it. Um, we built a grave to represent all of the people murdered by the police and, and we wanted to speak with the mayor about it. And we saw him walking down the hallway and he saw us and he turned around and left and never came back that whole day. He must have gone to work from home or somewhere else in the city halls. If we could consider each other a neighbor, a friend, or a brother, it could be a wonderful, wonderful world. It could be a wonderful world. Mm -hmm. It could be a wonderful world. If each little kid could have fresh milk each day, if each one who worked had enough time to play, if each homeless soul had a good place to stay, it could be a wonderful world. Mm -hmm. It could be a wonderful world. If we could consider each other a neighbor, a friend, or a brother, it could be a wonderful, wonderful world. It could be a wonderful world. Mm -hmm. It could be a wonderful world. If there were no poor and the rich were content, if strangers were welcome wherever they went, if each of us knew what true brotherhood meant, it could be a wonderful world. Mm -hmm. It could be a wonderful world. If we could consider each other a neighbor, a friend, or a brother, it could be a wonderful, wonderful world. It could be a wonderful world. Mm -hmm. It could